Imagine you get into the nursing program of your dreams. You're doing one of your final clinical rotations at a prestigious hospital you hope to work at someday after graduation. This was what was going on in Michelle Lay's life before a camera in a parking garage catches the last glimpse of her that anyone would ever see. This is her story. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. And like always, thankfully, let's thank our sponsor for today. Today's video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. It's the best place to find and watch documentaries about science, history, technology, nature, travel, and so much more. I've actually been using Curiosity Stream for, I would say, about a year now, and I love it. A couple of my previous cases and a few that I haven't posted yet have been based on shows I saw on this platform. Curiosity Stream has exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else, plus the deepest collection of the best documentaries from around the world, deeper than any other streaming service out there. And I know how much you love my deep dives with all the extra facts and details. That's how these documentaries are on Curiosity Stream. They also have new shows every single week. It's one of the very best deals in streaming. Curiosity Stream actually has a new special documentary that's premiering called CSI on Trial, but wait, let me explain because I know you're gonna like this. This Curiosity Stream original is a six part series that really puts forensic science to the test. That's why they call it Crime Scene Investigation on Trial. We rely so heavily on forensic science. It's almost a must have in court cases these days, but this show dives into the blind trust that we have in this process and really puts it to the test, showing how all the results are actually calculated and exposing flaws in the standard CSI methods that we see used in real life criminal cases, especially DNA, which we know definitely helps prove that many people are guilty, but also helps to prove that some have been wrongly convicted. And it can show that the actual forensic science that was used to convict them was not accurate. In this new show, you will hear some of these emotional stories of people that are wrongly convicted but who are now free. You'll also hear from people who are believed to be innocent but still remain behind bars. I'm really into forensics. I love understanding every little detail, so I know that I'm going to enjoy this series and I know you're a lot like me and you like learning everything, so I think you'll like it too. The episodes that I can't wait to dive into are the blood pattern analysis and the footwear analysis episode, especially with the Brian Koberger preliminary hearing. It's just around the corner in June. So we better brush up so we can follow along and of course offer our expertise in Facebook groups. Curiosity is the entertainment brand for people who want to know more, not just what's on the surface. It's available to watch on all your favorite streaming devices on the web, on TV through Roku, Xbox, Smart TVs, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and more, and on all your mobile devices. Plus, it's available worldwide. Go to curiositystream.com slash Kimberlea or scan the QR code for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And for all of you, if you use the promo code Kimberlea, you will save 25% off. It's already one of the most affordable and best deals in streaming, and now you get an additional discount. So click the link below or go to curiositystream.com slash Kimberlea and save 25% right now. And if you happened to catch the CSI on trial show, let me know in the comments. I want to know your thoughts. And I just want to thank Curiosity Stream for sponsoring today's video. Thank you so very much. And now let's get into the story for today. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the beautiful, intelligent, hardworking Vietnamese American nursing student, Michelle Lay. She was born in San Diego, California on October 3rd, 1984. And about three years later, her brother Michael was born. Michelle's mom and her father, son Lay, were immigrants from Vietnam. And their families migrated to California in the 70s when they were forced to flee Vietnam after the war. And their journey was not an easy one to get to this country. They traveled in an open boat on the South China Sea and spent months in refugee camps. 
until they finally arrived in San Diego, a place that they would learn to call home, but were completely unfamiliar with. They didn't speak the language or know anyone, but they persevered. And after time, they truly embraced the American culture. There were doctors, lawyers, and other business professionals in Michelle's extended family. And by the time her mother and father got together, they had fully accepted the American culture, but that didn't mean they divorced themselves from their roots, not at all. Though they celebrated American holidays and called the United States home, they still held on to their Vietnamese traditions. Family was the most important, and as a matter of fact, it was common for many of the relatives to share one household, which meant at any time, there could be 15 children under one roof, and that felt right to the Lays. They loved being surrounded by those who loved them. Michelle's mother was an extraordinary woman. She was a true role model. She worked as a nurse practitioner, and she would be gone all day long taking care of other people, and she still had time to devote to her two children. One of Michelle and Michael's favorite pastimes was when their mom would read to them at night. They had a favorite story. It was called The Woman on the Moon. And Michelle's mom used to have the children look up at the moon at night. And she would say, if you look closely, the shadows covering the moon's surface resembled a woman with long, dark hair. And the story of the woman on the moon was a Vietnamese love story. It was about a woman trapped on the moon looking down on earth for the man that she loved. Folklore and fairy tales are a part of many of our childhoods, and a lot of time they're used to make sense of things that we don't understand. Some teach us lessons, and others provide comfort in times of sorrow. The lay children had a real-life superhero living in their home, though, their super mom, and she did it all with a smile on her face. She was kind, generous, and hardworking, and she and her husband made sure that their children never had to go without anything the way that they had sometimes growing up. Michelle was the oldest of 15 cousins, and she followed in her mom's footsteps. She was always taking care of her younger relatives, especially her brother. She was like a second mom to him. Michelle grew up in the Rancho Penasquitos neighborhood in San Diego. It's called PQ to those who live there. And this is the suburbs, lots of parks, families with children, coffee shops, young professionals, highly rated public schools. Here it is on the map. The homes are very cookie cutter. It's highly populated and considered a very safe place to live. They had a comfortable life. The Lays would take vacations with their extended family and have weekly get-togethers for dinner and other events. They were a very large, close-knit Vietnamese family. They would do anything for one another. And Sun Lay's side of the family was about to step up in a major way. Back in 1994, Michelle's mom was keeping a secret. Michelle and Michael were about 10 and 7 years old when their mom found out that she had breast cancer, that she didn't want her battle to be her children's battle. She knew if they found out, it would cause them fear and anxiety and sadness, so instead, she kept her diagnosis to herself and she suffered in silence. She wanted her children to grow up strong, and she believed that it would affect them way too much to care for a dying mother, so she never let the truth be known. Just five years later, in 1999, the family gathered for Thanksgiving dinner and everyone was in attendance. They had a wonderful time, and Michelle's mom acted as usual, but that would be the last time they saw her alive. Just days after, on December 1st, 1999, Michelle and Michael received the devastating news that their mother had succumbed to her cancer, a disease that they never knew she was battling, and it came as a huge shock to everyone in their family. To think that she fought that battle all alone, and she selflessly sacrificed her own emotions to safeguard her children. This made it even more difficult for them to cope with her death. They had not been given a chance to prepare for it. It was tough on everyone, especially Michelle, who was only 14. She had to step up even more as a mother figure to her 11-year-old brother. Sun Lei moved his family in with his sister, and her house was about 15 minutes away in Miramesa which is very similar to PQ. Michelle's aunt had kids of her own around Michelle and Michael's age, and one of them was Christine Din. She was just three years younger than Michelle. It was as though they inherited a new set of brothers and sisters after losing their mother. That did help with the grief, but it did not take it away. At least they could share their sorrow with someone else and become stronger for it. Michael wasn't taking their mother's death well. Michelle found him holding on to something of their mother's and crying alone. This was his way of finding comfort and a connection after she passed. He was clinging to a piece of her 
and the memories that they had shared. And at that moment, Michelle knew that she needed to step up and overcome her sense of loss and be there for her brother. And soon Michelle became more of a mother than a sister to Michael. This helped Michelle cope. She wanted to be brave and to honor her mother. And over time, Michelle and her cousin Christine also formed a special bond. They grew closer and closer throughout their teens. Michelle was especially grateful to Christine because that was the friendship she needed in one of the hardest times she was going through after her mother's death. And Michelle was there to be a big sister to Christine. She was there to guide her in all things related to being a young woman, especially when it came to boys. Michelle actually helped Christine write her first love letter. She went with her to the mall to purchase her first bra. She taught her how to tweeze her eyebrows, put on makeup, and straighten her hair. I honestly wish I had someone like Michelle in my life because I'm the oldest of my siblings. So I remember having to learn everything so that I could pass it down to everyone else. Growing up, Michelle's cousins looked up to her and Christine wanted to be just like her. They even looked alike and people would call Christine a mini Michelle. By the time she was in high school, Michelle attended Mount Carmel High School, which was about 10 minutes away from where they lived. Her motherly instincts extended beyond caring for her own family because Michelle took children under her wing all the time. She was popular at Mount Carmel. She used to hang out with the cool kids and she always had boys chasing her. They were just always trying to get her attention, but she was humble. It's like she didn't really know how beautiful she really was. An example of this was one afternoon, Michelle saw a little girl, her name was Giselle Esteban. She was sitting all alone at the lunchroom table. Michelle went over there, she introduced herself and she asked the girl if she wanted to have lunch with her. They hit it off and over time, they became best friends. That's just how Michelle was. Giselle was quiet and reserved, but Michelle was very outgoing and that helped her come out of her shell. She was generous and kind. She would spend time with Giselle doing normal teenage stuff, like going to the movies, going out to eat, and many times they would have each other over at their homes for family dinners. Michelle treated everyone like family and she welcomed Giselle with open arms. You actually never know who you may connect with if you don't give someone a chance. And Michelle was all about opening herself up to people. She had a lot of friends, but her and Giselle had so much in common that they became so close. Giselle was from a Filipino-American family of immigrants. She also grew up in San Diego, and just like Michelle, she was born in 1984 to a very close-knit family who worked really hard to make ends meet. She also had many professionals in her extended family, and she was brought up with the same work ethic as Michelle. Both of these young women had so much ambition. Michelle wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps and honor her memory by becoming a nurse, and soon, Giselle decided she wanted to go down the very same path. So after they graduated high school in 2002, they both applied to college to get their prerequisites out of the way before they could apply to nursing schools. The pair decided that they should move to San Francisco to study because it would be so much fun. It would be a change of scenery, they could be very independent, and there were a lot more opportunities in a big city. You know, I like to tell you all the details about how these people I introduce you to go through the different stages in their lives that led them to where they ended up. And the next chapter for Michelle was college. Initially, she got into San Jose State University and Giselle landed a spot at San Francisco State University. Michelle planned to transfer to San Francisco State to be closer to Giselle, but for now, they were about an hour apart, but school came first. So they focused on their studies while they kept in touch until they reunited. And that came the very next semester, spring of 2003. Michelle transferred into San Fran State. So now the two best friends were spending time together once again and making new friends. One of those friends was a guy named Scott Marisigan. He was a fellow student who was already a part of Giselle's friend group and was introduced to Michelle when she started attending San Fran State. Well, Michelle and Scott hit it off right away, but it turned out they didn't quite match when it came to anything romantic in nature, and they decided they were better as friends. They did kind of see each other for a month, but Michelle had her eyes set on someone else at the time, so nothing ever came out of it, but they got along great. So they still remained in the same social group with Giselle and their other friends. Eventually by the fall of that year, 2003, Giselle and Scott were spending a lot more time together and unlike Scott and Michelle that fizzled out, Giselle and Scott were hot and heavy. So of course, Michelle being mutual friend of Scott and Giselle, she definitely approved 
of the romance, even though she had, of course, briefly considered Scott for a partner herself. They never were physical with each other, and they got along great. So Michelle was super happy for her bestie. But the three of them spent a lot of time together. Michelle always had guys around, so she could go on double dates with the couple, and they just had so much fun. But as most of us know, when we have big changes in our lives and dating someone exclusively can be one of those changes, our paths can go in different directions than our friends no matter how close we are. And that's what happened to Michelle and Giselle. It's completely normal. Giselle had found the one. She was spending way more time with Scott and less time with Michelle. And that was okay with Michelle because she was working hard to get her prerequisites in order to apply to nursing school. So the years went on and by the spring of 2005, Giselle had some big news. She was pregnant. She and Scott were going to have a daughter together and Michelle was so happy for Giselle. But their lives really were going in two totally different directions. Giselle had decided to put a pause on college in order to focus on her family and Michelle was putting in hours at both work and school to reach her goals. And by late October of that year, Giselle gave birth to her daughter, Isabel, and she decided to work at a daycare center to provide for her growing family. At this point, Michelle had just landed a job at Turner Construction as an accounting clerk, and she too was in a serious relationship with her boyfriend, Tommy. Life was progressing. Friends were becoming more distant, and I know this all too well. But at least there's social media where we can look in on the lives of our loved ones and the people we care about the most. We can check in from time to time and catch up on their lives, and that's what Michelle and Giselle were left doing because their lives changed so fast and frequently. Let me know if you can relate to this, because I know when I got pregnant, a lot of my friends didn't really want to hang out anymore. I was the girl who, I don't know, like couldn't drink, couldn't go out as much, and I get it, but it can be really lonely. And I've also been on the other side because I was the first to have kids in my group of friends. So while they were building their families, I was kind of back to living it up and having fun and the tables will just keep turning. Years went on, and by August of 2010, Michelle had gotten accepted into Samuel Merritt University's Accelerated Nursing Program, and this was a grueling, intensive, short-term program where students earn a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in just 12 months instead of two years, and getting into the school is not easy. First, you have to have a bachelor's degree with a good GPA, score high on the entrance exams, have great recommendations, and they only accept about 300 students every year, even though hundreds apply. Michelle was very proud of her accomplishment. So one of the first people that she told the news to was her high school bestie, Giselle. And as they were catching up, Giselle had news of her own. By then, she and Scott had gone their separate ways, and they were trying their best to co-parent little five-year-old Isabel. Giselle told Michelle that now that she was sharing custody of Isabel, she was finally ready to get serious about studying, and also about hanging out with Michelle more, kind of rekindle their friendship. Michelle was always there for her friends, so of course, she told Giselle if she needed anything to let her know. But that year was gonna be a lot for Michelle. And even though she had good intentions, any spare time she had, she had to use for work or to study. Her new school was in Oakland and it was across the bay from San Francisco. Michelle was living about 40 minutes away in San Mateo. And it was an exciting time for her. She was living her dream. And her brother was not too far behind because he decided that he also wanted to work in the medical field. So at the time, he was an EMT and he was studying for a psychology degree at University of California, Berkeley. And that was only about 20 minutes away from where Michelle was going to school. So finally, someone in her family was close by because everyone else was still eight hours away in San Diego. But Michelle had always kept in touch, especially with Christine, who was actually set to move in with Michelle by the summer of 2011. At that point, Michelle would be graduated from Samuel Merritt and be working as a nurse at a nearby hospital. That was the plan anyway. Over the years, Michelle still made it a point to spend as much time with her family and close friends as she could, as they all grew up and went in their separate directions. She would do holidays, special events, and that would always bring them together. But for the next year, Michelle had to get really serious. This program that she was in was very fast paced. After she completed her workload on campus, she had to complete rotations at a hospital nearby called Kaiser Permanente, where they offered a work study program. So you get paid as you learn and you go through all these different clinical departments. One could be mental health, another could be emergency surgery until you were to complete all departments in your program. Kaiser 
is a very well-respected hospital. It's a dream for many nursing students to work there one day. And by May of 2011, Michelle was 26 years old and she was working in the labor and delivery rotation in the maternity ward at Kaiser. Memorial Day was coming up from Saturday, May 28th through Monday, May 30th. And the last day of those rotations was Friday the 27th. So she planned to drive to Reno and meet up with some friends after she completed her final shift at around 10 p.m. She was under a lot of pressure in the weeks leading up to this day. She had her final evaluation that night and her last one with her instructor, Lori Rosa, hadn't gone perfectly. She was informed that there were a few things that Michelle needed to work on to pass with an A, which is what she strived for. Michelle was a straight A student. She took this program very seriously and she was anxious about the end of the session. She wanted to make sure that everything went smoothly. Instructor Rosa paired each student with a hospital nurse who worked in either the labor and delivery or the maternity unit, and then they monitored the progress of the students throughout their shift. It was an all-day shift, with just a couple breaks throughout the day. And on one of those breaks, it was right before 7 p.m., Michelle told one of the Kaiser nurses who worked in the maternity unit that she was going to quickly step out and go to her car, which was in an attached parking garage and she needed to grab some medication that she had to take. Michelle made her way to the parking garage. To do so, she had to walk through a pedestrian bridge that connected the hospital to the parking structure. Shortly after 7 p.m., a hospital security guard notified instructor Rosa that Michelle did not sign out at the end of her shift in the maternity ward. So Rosa searched the ward. She sent Michelle a text and she also left a voicemail, but she wasn't able to contact her. A couple hours later, just before 9 p.m., the handful of nursing students were wrapping up their final shift, and instructor Rosa was calling them together for their evaluations. That's when she noticed Michelle still wasn't in attendance, and that was not like her. She asked the students if they knew where she was, and after a few minutes, they determined the last time anyone saw Michelle was at that 7 p.m. break when she said she needed to go get her medication in her car. This concerned instructor Rosa. Was Michelle okay? Did she have some kind of medical emergency? What was going on? The students all parked on the third floor of the parking garage, so instructor Rosa thought it would be a good idea to go check to see if Michelle's car was parked in the spot they had last seen it in earlier that day. She did call a security guard to go with her, just in case that they were to find Michelle in need of assistance. When someone says that they're taking medication, a red flag definitely goes up, especially for a nursing instructor, and she didn't know what to expect, but she wanted to be prepared. However, as they make their way to Michelle's parking spot, her brand new white 2010 Honda CRV isn't there. The instructor and the security guard decide they're gonna walk up and down the rows of cars just to make sure that Michelle hadn't moved her car. And all of a sudden, instructor Rosa sees it the white CRV, and it's making its way back up the ramp towards the spot that Michelle had been parked in. What is going on? Why would Michelle leave without telling her instructor or telling anyone? Instructor Rosa begins to flag her down, but just as she's able to catch a glimpse of the front of the vehicle, it literally stops and begins backing down the ramp. The instructor runs down this ramp on foot, trying to catch up with her, and she saw Michelle's car almost hit another student's vehicle. And then it's basically zigzagging across the parking garage and speeding away. And that is really odd. It didn't make sense. Where was Michelle going? And was she trying to deliberately avoid her instructor? She wasn't in trouble. It was okay if she needed to leave, but it just wasn't like her not to be transparent about her plans. The instructor didn't know what to think at this point. Could Michelle be experiencing a medical condition? Was she not thinking correctly? Did she need help? She called Michelle's phone several times. She left a few voice messages, but Michelle never responded. So after talking to the students, they all agreed that this was a very out of character for Michelle. They were all calling her now. They were all texting her, including a guy that she was supposedly seeing that was in the program with her and no one heard back. Instructor Rosa was so concerned with this behavior, she called the Hayward Police Department and by 10 p.m., she reported Michelle missing or in distress. She wasn't sure. She just felt like something was wrong. However, this isn't the highest priority because after all, Michelle is an adult. She could come and go as she pleased. And although it was maybe against the rules for her to skip out on her rotation, it wasn't illegal for her to decide to leave class 
and no one saw anything that would suggest Michelle was hurt. But the police department still sent out an officer to speak with instructor Rosa. All the students provided information about Michelle to the officer. They said that she was punctual, responsible, and that she didn't mention anything about leaving early. However, some did say that she mentioned going on a trip following that night's session. So they gave the officer the name of the friend that she was supposed to be meeting with. They didn't have much to go on at this point. Yeah, it's concerning. Michelle had worked really hard to get where she was. She had invested a lot of time, energy, and money into her nursing education. So it did shock her classmates to think that she would just leave, especially when she was at the finish line. She needed this rotation to graduate, but maybe she was under so much stress. But even then, she would let her instructor know that. They believed something had to have happened because just leaving in the middle of a clinical essential for graduation was highly unlikely. There just had to be a reason. The officer asked instructor Rosa what Michelle looked like when she was racing away in the garage. Did she appear scared, in distress? But the instructor said, I didn't actually see her. I just knew it was her car because I was familiar with it. The officer was escorted to the parking garage, which is about a 10 minute walk from the hospital. They went through the footbridge and to the third floor. He took note of the parking spot as well as the times that the instructor and the classmates said that they saw Michelle last, including the time her car was seen speeding away. Now, Michelle's purse and her keys were left behind in a break room. All she took with her was her cell phone. So this truly did look as though she intended to come right back. So what happened? Could she have gotten a call? Maybe there was a family emergency and she left right away, not caring about leaving her things behind, thinking, you know what, they're safe and I'll just explain later. Or did something happen to her? Did she get sick? Because she was on medication. So perhaps she drove home, she came back only to realize, you know what, I can't stay in class, I'm too ill. There were so many questions, but not much the officer could do. They did take down all the information about Michelle, her vehicle make, and the model, as well as contact information for all of her classmates and friends. They planned to wait and see if she would show up the next day. The next day came, it was Saturday, and all night, Michelle's friends had been texting her and they were trying to piece together her whereabouts. They were texting each other, and by the morning, her ex-boyfriend Tommy texted Michelle's closest cousin, Christine. He said, we cannot find Michelle. Well, Christine did know Michelle very well. They grew up together, and Michelle was known to be someone who worked hard, but she also played hard. And it was a holiday weekend, so Christine knew Michelle had been under a lot of stress, and she just figured, you know what? She went out really late the night before, and maybe she spent the night out with friends. She didn't think much of it. She just looked at the text, and she kind of thought, okay, what did Michelle get herself into now? And then she turned over, and she went back to sleep. However, a few hours later, after texting and calling Michelle several times without getting an answer, Christine began to get worried. Meanwhile, Michelle's brother Michael had gotten the same text from Tommy that no one could find Michelle. Michael knew Michelle and Tommy had recently broken up. He really wasn't sure what his sister's intentions were with Tommy at that point, and he didn't want to get involved in any drama. So he simply ignored the message. However, something was nagging at the back of Michael's mind. So he logged onto Facebook to see what Michelle had been doing. When he scrolled through his sister's feed, he saw that Michelle had some friends in town who planned on visiting Reno that day. Michael texted one of Michelle's friends who was joining her on that trip to find out where his sister was. After sending the message, Michael left his house for work and started his day. It wasn't until later that day when Michelle's nursing instructor called him that it really hit him that Michelle could be in danger. Unbeknownst to Christine and Michael, Michelle's closest friends had gathered earlier that day at the Hayward Police Department as soon as it opened, before Inspector Fraser Ritchie even had a chance to get there because he had just been assigned this case. Once he got there, he ushered them into a conference room to gather information about what they knew. He was also briefed by the officer from the night before who went out to Kaiser. It had been at least 12 hours since anyone had seen Michelle. And because of how concerned her loved ones were, with some actually beginning to drive the eight hours from San Diego, Inspector Ritchie really wanted to figure out what was going on. He interviewed the friends who had come to the station to offer up any information that they had, and they all said the same thing. The Michelle was so organized, she had a plan A, B, C, D, and the list goes on. 
But what they did say is it was possible that she could have been under a lot of stress and that she could have taken off and just left to get away from it all. Though possible, it just didn't seem to be her style. Inspector Richie left to follow up on some of that information and her family was just in this conference room for hours wondering what happened. Did they find her? Were there any leads? But the police wouldn't give them any information. However, they would ask a bunch of questions like what kind of car did she have? But why? And then it was just silence. It's tough because in order to do a thorough investigation, the police have to withhold information. That's just part of the process. And with the information provided by Michelle's friends and family, Inspector Ritchie was able to determine that Michelle's new CRV had low jack on it. It's an anti-theft device that's installed on newer vehicles in order to track their location. It didn't take long for them to get a hit. A townhouse community on Ponderosa Court about a half a mile away from Kaiser. A mere two minute drive. Here's what it looks like in that area. Her car was parked in a guest spot in front of one of these townhouses down a parking lot like this. And when they got close to it to inspect it, they noticed it was locked and there was nothing really wrong with it. It wasn't parked weird. It didn't have any external damage and they could kind of look inside. The, the windows were very tinted, but from what they could see, there was just ordinary items on the back seat. There was a shopping bag, some opened Amazon packages, garbage, a Victoria's Secret catalog, pair of shoes, and they saw a prescription bag. You know, the kind that you get from like CVS or Rite Aid that was laying on the back seat. So that must have been what Michelle went out to her car to retrieve. In the front, they could see a can of soda in the cup holder. But for the most part, the car was pretty clean. I mean, it was new. It didn't even have metal license plate on it yet. It still had the paper ones from the dealership. They had her car, but not a warrant to search it. So all they could do is gather info from what was on the outside. And after looking underneath, they do see some fresh brush or grass hanging from the tailgate area. So this could mean that the car was taken off road. And though the car did have that dark tint on it, they thought they could see something on the front passenger seat that looked like it could be a stain of some kind, but they couldn't be sure. But why was Michelle's car parked here? None of her friends lived in this complex. Did she drive there to talk to someone? Why? Well, when they interviewed one of the residents, they did say they saw some headlights shine through their window around 4 a.m. and they heard people having a conversation. It seemed like it was coming from the direction where Michelle's vehicle was, but they admitted they never looked outside, so they didn't know for sure, but it was 4 a.m. Michelle's vehicle was last seen at 9 p.m. It was all too confusing. A tow truck came, they moved Michelle's vehicle so a forensics team could analyze the car and secure any evidence found inside. Inspector Ritchie searched this entire area where Michelle's vehicle was parked, but he did not find anything suspicious. No blood or evidence of a struggle. However, he was concerned about Michelle's belongings being left behind, her purse, her wallet. They were at the medical center's break room. People don't just leave their belongings behind, so that was a red flag. If Michelle did leave to go meet someone here, why wouldn't she bring her things, especially if she wasn't planning on coming back? So Richie needed to go back to the hospital and gather more evidence. He noticed there was a lot of cameras in the parking garage. So he asked the security department to pull all the footage from May 27th, but there was an issue. Only the live feed could be viewed on site. The hospital had a contract with a third party and the recorded footage was stored at an offsite location. So it was gonna take hours to retrieve it. So now they had to wait. By now, Michael had heard back from Michelle's friends who were supposed to travel with her the night before. They had planned to meet up at a coffee shop on Friday night after her shift, but she never showed up and she never made it out to Reno. So Michael decided it was time to take a trip over to the hospital where many of Michelle's friends had gathered and were already handing out missing persons flyers. They had Michelle's face on them and all of her information. That she was 26, five foot six, black hair, brown eyes, and she had a tattoo of her mother's name on her chest. She was wearing white scrubs, and she was last seen at seven o'clock on Friday, May 27th at Kaiser Hospital. Then something unexpected happened. Around 12.45 p.m., all of her friends started getting texts from her. All their messages were being responded to. They were able to breathe a sigh of relief. But what did the messages say? Well, one of the first ones said, I'm not missing. And many of the other texts were explaining that Michelle's phone had been acting crazy. It had sleeted everything. 
There was other messages that said, you know what, all your texts just killed my battery. And additional responses let her friends know that she was fine. She was just taking it easy or it's okay, I'm okay, I just needed a break. She messaged one person that she just needed some time without anyone. And one of her loved ones got a message that said Michelle had a really bad night the night before and she didn't wanna to talk to anyone. Even Inspector Richie had called and texted Michelle. He made it clear that this was not a joke and she needed to call him back immediately. She responded by text and she said that she was looking for a charger right now and that her phone kept dropping calls. Her friends and family sent over 100 texts and phone calls in the 15 hours that she had been missing. And now all of them were being responded to. But then by 2 p.m., the text just stopped again. That was odd. But what was even more concerning was that Michelle didn't make the effort to call her loved ones back. It was clear they were worried. By now, she was fully aware or should have been that they had called the police, driven eight hours, and passed out missing persons flyers and found her car abandoned, yet she failed to pick up the phone and talk to any of them? It made no sense. Inspector Ritchie heard all the concerns and he had them too. The fact that she didn't call the police back after informing her that they were doing an investigation, that didn't add up. And not only that, her ex, Tommy, who she dated for years, told Ritchie that he got a very unusual response from Michelle's number. She knew his number by heart. Yet, when she texted him back, she said, who is this? I don't have your number on my phone. Even if she had deleted his contact, she would know his number. So that didn't make sense. And at this point, all Michelle's friends and family members believe someone else is using Michelle's phone to contact them. And it frightened her brother. He felt like he was living in a nightmare, like this could not be happening. It was unreal. They truly believe someone took her from that hospital parking lot that night. That was the only thing that made sense now. But Richie wasn't so sure. He realized that all of this seemed out of character for Michelle, but what if she really just didn't want to talk to anyone? So what if she told her ex that she didn't know who he was? Perhaps it was to give him a hint that she wasn't interested in speaking with him. True, it was odd that she didn't call back the police station, but again, if you were really trying to get away, leave town, and you weren't missing, would you really have a reason to call? It's not a crime to leave on your own volition. The security footage from the parking garage had just come back though. And there were over 100 hours of video and 330 different camera angles. It was gonna take a long time to comb through. So Richie decided to start the last known sighting of Michelle and that was right before 7 p.m. Sure enough, as he's scrubbing through the footage, he spots Michelle briskly walking through that footbridge from the hospital to the parking garage. And nothing seems out of the ordinary. She's not being followed or chased. She just looks as though she's trying to be quick because she's got to be back within 15 minutes. Here she is on camera. This is the actual recording at 6.55 p.m. And then the next camera captures her walking in the direction of her vehicle, which would have been parked on the right side. It's out of frame. Since her car is near a camera, there was one right on top of where she was parked. Richie wants to see that vantage point, but unfortunately, I swear this happens in every one of these cases. It was a newly installed camera it wasn't set to record footage. So though it would have captured everything, it wasn't working and isn't it always that way? Who's in charge of these kind of things? Because I swear, it's always that one vital camera that's not working. But what they do capture is this. At 7.17 p.m., Michelle's car is leaving the parking garage. But why? The next thing Richie looks for is the instructor and the security guard. They arrive in the location around 8.56 p.m. And just like Lori Rosa said, you can kind of see a white Honda CRV come up that ramp at around 9.06 p.m. Now, what you can't see is Rosa waving it down because she's out of frame here. However, you can see, see this, how the car just stops and then backs up. And in the following viewpoint, it's almost clipping that pole when it's racing out of the garage. Richie just had to see this for himself, but it leaves even more questions. What made Michelle leave class? Was it really her medication? Or did she get a text from someone? Was she lured out to the parking lot? Was she kidnapped? He just didn't know. He wasn't any closer to understanding what happened between 7 and 9 p.m. And the video was too grainy for him to tell if it was Michelle behind the wheel of the SUV. But they were about to get a break in this case, the biggest one yet. 
The forensic team that was analyzing Michelle's vehicle, they found something in the front passenger seat. It was kind of halfway shoved under the seat. It's an ID, not a license, but a clip-on badge from Samuel Merritt Nursing School. And it wasn't Michelle's. It had a picture and a name of another woman, Elaine San Augustine, BSN RN adjunct assistant instructor. Who was this woman? And why was her badge in Michelle's car? Richie calls up instructor Rosa to ask for information about this person, but that name was not familiar to her. So it was time to call around to figure out who this person was because maybe they knew where Michelle had gone. Or worse, maybe it was her that was involved in her disappearance. But there was more. It wasn't looking like Michelle had merely gone missing. There was evidence that led investigators to believe that Michelle was probably dead. It would come as a shock to her family, especially since the investigators had to keep all of the evidence close to their vest and under seal. But there were suspected blood stains all around inside of Michelle's car, as well as between the door frame and the floor runner. First, there's a kind of lighter stain on the front passenger side on the seat. But then look at the passenger side door. There is blood in the door frame area and not a little bit either. It's in the back seat, it's in the back passenger side floor mat, and it was very obvious that blood had to be actively dripping from a wound onto the back seat passenger side floorboard. Investigators believe this is where Michelle had been placed after she was attacked. And the amount of blood it would take to leave these stains behind meant that Michelle was most likely unable to survive this attack, if this was indeed Michelle's blood. It still needed to be tested for DNA, but it wasn't looking good. They also pulled fingerprints from around inside of the vehicle. They gathered hairs. They tested various surfaces for DNA. And all along, Michelle's family was holding out hope that she was still alive. Missing, but alive. And there were nights Christine would shiver and think to herself, I really hope Michelle's wearing a jacket and that she's warm because she didn't want to think about her cousin that she loved like a sister being out there alone in the cold. That was sad. Samuel Marriott got back to Inspector Ritchie about the woman whose ID they had found in Michelle's car. She was a brand new instructor. She hadn't even started working at the school yet. And she was supposed to be out of state in Hawaii on vacation. But was she? Or was there more to that story as well? Richie knew that he needed to find out where this woman was and talk to her, but in the meanwhile, he also compiled a list of Michelle's closest friends and family members and had been interviewing each of them to gather as much information as he could. Everyone had positive things to say about Michelle, about how responsible she was, how you could always count on her. She was kind, caring, and she had her friends' backs, except one friend, an old friend, who knew Michelle better than most. Remember Giselle? Well, she was one of the people on the list that Richie needed to speak with. He had been told that Giselle was one of Michelle's closest and oldest friends, but they weren't close as of lately. As he had done with the previous friends, he paid Giselle a visit at her apartment in Union City, which was about a 25 minute drive from where Michelle lived and only a 10 minute drive from Kaiser. Inspector Richie knocked and when Giselle came to the door, he introduced himself and explained that they were there about a concern regarding Michelle Lay. And when Giselle heard the name, she's kind of like, who? And she seemed a little annoyed, kind of like, Ugh, what is it this time? That kind of response. And Richie explained that Michelle had gone missing. Giselle's attitude was sort of dry. There just didn't seem to be a lot of worry in her voice. She was just very matter of fact, like, okay, well, have you tried calling her? texting her, reaching out to her friends. And Richie was like, well, yeah, that's why we're here. We heard that the two of you had known each other a long time, but that you had somewhat of a falling out a few years back. This was information that they had gathered from a few of the meetings with other recent friends of Michelle's. One person actually described Giselle and her relationship as tumultuous, which was the word that Inspector Richie used, asking Giselle if it was true. She laughed. She was like, almost questioning why he used that word as though it was kind of above and beyond a little bit more drama than what the status of their relationship really was. However, remember I said all of Michelle's friends except Giselle had positive things to say about her. Well, maybe people who know us the longest have seen us through many different life experiences and maybe they have a different point of view than acquaintances and classmates. 
because as Giselle explained, Michelle wasn't the perfect person that everyone claimed she was. Richie was all ears. He needed to know every point of view, even less favorable ones. It's part of victimology, understanding the victim's personality, mentality, and position in life that could have gotten them hurt or in danger. So Giselle explained, they were very close until Michelle's true colors shined through. She was a liar and she betrayed her. She said that they were her best friends, but her then BFF slept with her then fiance. Well, there was a lot to dig into. So Richie asked Giselle to come down to the station to make a formal report so they could have all of this information on the record. Giselle agreed. Once in the interview room, she explained that Michelle had dated Scott before he and Giselle became a thing. Once she got serious with Scott, she wasn't as comfortable with Michelle hanging around him, especially since they seemed to be flirting with one another and they had a past. Even though it had only been a month that they were kind of together casually, it didn't matter because the time came when Giselle found out Michelle had been keeping a secret from her. And as her best friend, that seemed really messed up. It hurt Giselle and it involved the man she loved. Apparently, according to Giselle, back in the fall of 2003, when the three of them used to hang out regularly and Giselle had just gotten into this serious relationship with Scott, Michelle confided in him and only him that she was pregnant, but planned to have an abortion. Michelle insisted that Scott keep this information to himself and not tell Giselle. Well, a few weeks later, Giselle finds out about Michelle's secret and that Scott had already known. Giselle didn't just feel betrayed because two of the people she trusted the most had been lying to her. She honestly felt like there was more to their secret keeping. She believed they had gotten too close and they slept together behind her back and that Scott had cheated on her with her best friend. Why else in her mind? Would Michelle reach out to him to tell him that she's pregnant and getting an abortion? That's the only thing that made sense to Giselle. But both Scott and Michelle denied ever having been in a sexual relationship before Giselle and Scott were dating or at any other time ever. It didn't matter how much they denied it. Giselle was furious. She just would not accept any other reason why they would have kept this a secret from her. So things became rocky with her and Michelle. She still wanted Bally to be close to her, but she just had a hard time trusting her friend after that. However, by 2005, she and Scott had broken up anyway, so she did keep in touch with Michelle here and there. She wasn't completely out of her life, and Michelle tried hard to make things right. She would reassure Giselle that nothing ever happened. Michelle still hung out in Giselle and Scott's friend group, and despite Giselle's wishes, Scott was still nice to Michelle and considered her a friend. A few months after they split up, Scott and Giselle ended up getting back together. That was the summer of 2005 when Giselle found out she was pregnant. So she and Scott tried to do the right thing and make things work between them for the baby. Isabel was born October 31st of that year and things seemed to be okay for a while until about a year after the baby was born. All of a sudden, Giselle sensed that Michelle and Scott were talking again. He reassured her they were merely platonic, but at this point, Giselle had had enough. She told Scott it was either her or Michelle, so Scott agreed to stop talking to Michelle or being friends with her to keep things positive between him and the mother of his child. They dated and lived together for three years, but things ended up falling apart and they broke up in the summer of 2008. I told you that it was at this point when Giselle kind of tried to reconcile with Michelle. She talked about getting her life back in order and she didn't have full custody of Isabel anymore, and she was trying to co-parent with Scott. Well, there was a little more to that story. Their co-parenting turned into high-conflict parenting, and by August of 2010, they were at a therapy appointment, and the topic of Michelle came up. Giselle explained that she just still had this hostility and trust issues with Scott because of her belief that he and Michelle had been more than friends and had slept together. Not only that, ever since they had broken up, Giselle said that Scott was hanging out with Michelle and even going on dates with her recently. The therapist asked Giselle what would make her feel better. And they came to the conclusion that Michelle should come into one of these sessions with Scott and Giselle so they could talk it out. Michelle being who she was and trying to be there for her friends agreed. It wasn't easy. They hashed it out together. There were a lot of tears, a lot of anger. But in the end, it seemed like 
Everyone was in a good headspace. Giselle explained this to the investigator, but her words were a little harsh. She said that Scott made a mistake and Michelle made a mistake. They made a mistake together and her best friend slept with her fiance. So she still believed it, regardless of how things seem to have worked out in that therapy session just about a year ago. So what does this all mean? One thing, Michelle may not be perfect, but nobody said she was. It also showed that Giselle definitely held a grudge. But what did any of this have to do with Michelle's disappearance? Richie wasn't sure. But Giselle expressed that she was very tired and it was hard for her to concentrate because she had fatigue from being pregnant. Yes, Giselle was three months pregnant and investigators had had her there for hours and they felt like she had given them enough information and now she could go home. But what Richie really wanted to know was more about this Scott person. Although a lot of this did sound like high school drama or as they say, baby mama drama, he still had to look into everything and they had already preliminarily interviewed Scott when they were going down Michelle's list of friends. He mentioned some of the same things. The brief connection with Michelle, the relationship with Giselle, the friendship between him and Michelle bothering his ex, that he considered Michelle a dear friend and he seemed genuinely concerned by Michelle's sudden disappearance. He explained that the last time he heard from Michelle was on the morning of May 28th, the day after she went missing. During the time that everyone was texting her asking where she was, Scott had sent a text asking what she was doing that day. He didn't know she was missing. He was just having a normal conversation with her. Scott received a reply that Michelle was on her way to Reno and she was, quote, putting out fires, unquote, because people thought she was missing. Scott texted back because he wanted clarification, but he never received a response. Richie thought they had to take a deeper look. By now, many of Michelle's family members had come from out of town, so they pitched in for hotel rooms and they were going place to place, putting up flyers and hopping from hotel to hotel as they waited for answers. Since the Hayward Police Department hadn't told Michelle's family anything about the investigation, they were unaware of the developments. The details investigators uncovered concerning Michelle's disappearance were completely unknown to her family, but there were developments indeed. For one, the DNA taken from the swabs collected from Michelle's car came back positive as Michelle Lay's blood. And though her body had not been found, the police had found blood, not only in Michelle's car, but from day one in the parking spot where Michelle's car had been before she went missing. That's right, a fact that none of you knew about until now. On the floor of that parking garage, where the passenger side door would have been, there was a smear of blood. It looked as though someone had tried to actually wipe it up and it was confirmed to be Michelle's. Yet the family had no idea and they felt detached from the entire investigation. They weren't even informed that the investigation had gone from a missing person to a homicide. They had to find that out from watching the news and it really upset them. They felt like they were in the dark about everything. This was their loved one, yet the police couldn't give them the reasons why they felt that she was no longer alive. Yet both Michael and Christine believed that they could still feel Michelle's presence and unless the police could give them concrete proof that she was dead, they were going to continue to fight to find their lost sister and cousin no matter what. They weren't giving up hope because that's what they knew Michelle would do for them. When the police had the DNA confirmation, they did call Michelle's family to come down to the station for a meeting. It was then that they were officially informed that Michelle's case was now a homicide. Yet they still did not reveal the reasons why. As I said, Michelle's family did not take this well. They didn't like the way they were being treated. They just wanted to know why. Why do you believe Michelle is dead? But all they got was silence. One officer even had the audacity to say to Michelle's brother, you have to get comfortable with the fact that your sister is probably dead. But they couldn't let themselves believe it. It didn't seem real. On June 9th, a candlelight vigil was held at the parking lot where Michelle's car had been found. That was the last place that had a connection to Michelle. So a large number of Michelle's friends and family, even ones that came all the way from Vietnam, they were there as well as strangers who had never met Michelle. They were from the community, they heard about her story, and they wanted to come out to support the family. News stations were there, 
because Michelle's friends were diligent in keeping her name in the media. They were constantly making sure that no one forgot about Michelle. They made t-shirts from her missing persons flyers. Her face and all of her information were on it. They even put up a website, michellelaymissing.com, and that website became a hub. All the information was there and a place to support the Lay family because they needed it. It provided a central platform to share updates, organize volunteer search parties, and accept donations to support the case. They also set up a Facebook page that gave information about everything, daily tips that come in, where they could pass out flyers, and what events were coming up to support their search efforts. I went on there and I found this very extensive map. You've got to see this. I've never seen anything like this before. Someone put this together. It showed all of the places that flyers had already been distributed and it helped to organize where to go next. They wanted to make sure they were covering all areas so that they could get flyers into the hands of as many people as possible. And because they had Facebook and this group of people from all over the world, they were putting up flyers everywhere from Brazil to Iceland. Just look. This location says Claremont, and then it shows where the flyers were. Ranch 99, Yogurt World, Morning Glory, things like that. They were so organized. I was very impressed by this. So back to the vigil, so many people spoke, including Christine and Michael and Michelle's father. He criticized the Hayward Police Department. He stated that they were withholding information and until they had actual proof that Michelle was dead, until they saw a body, they wouldn't believe it for a minute. In order to locate Michelle, her family offered a reward. It was up to $65,000. $45,000 of that was donated by Michelle's place of employment, Turner Construction. She worked there for five years, and the rest came from various places, most of it from Michelle's family. They put up a huge billboard on the side of the highway. Her family hoped she was alive. They missed her. They wanted her to come home. They pleaded for help in front of the news cameras. And Christine, she started to think that maybe this had to do with human trafficking. It was at that time they knew they had to go even further in their search for Michelle. Investigators scan the crowd at the visual for anyone that seems suspicious or out of place. They do this a lot in these investigations just to see if they could follow a new lead. And sure enough, they spot someone that they had just looked up a few days before, Scott, Giselle's ex. This definitely wasn't the time to take him away and bring him in to the station, but they waited and they watched his demeanor. But like many other people, he seemed distraught, upset, and sad over Michelle being missing. But was he? Or could he have a reason to want her to be gone? He was still on their list as someone that they needed to speak to. At this point though, the family hired a private investigator to work on the case. And after looking over all the facts, this private investigator informed the family that they believed that there had to be two people involved in Michelle's disappearance. And at least one of them must have known her pretty well. Reason being, whoever took Michelle's vehicle after she disappeared knew where she was parked, her schedule, and where she would be. And his belief about why there were two people was because they had to have gotten Michelle into her car easily and quickly. So this private investigator asked the public to come forward with tips and he would make sure that those would get to the right people and tips did come in. One seemed promising. It was from an inmate and he said that Michelle was being held captive in a house in Hayward and this sent them on a wild goose chase because it turned out not to be connected to this case at all. And that must be frustrating because you feel this sense of relief but it's snuffed out right away. There was another detective looking into Michelle's case. He was from a different city in Northern California where he was investigating the disappearance and murder of another similar victim named Fong Lei. They even had the same last name and get this, they were around the same age. Fong was just days away from turning 25 before she went missing and she had recently graduated from a nursing program. She vanished outside a Barnes & Noble bookstore in a strip mall in Fairfield, California on April 25th, 2010. One year before Michelle, but just two weeks after she was reported missing, Vong Lei's remains were found by a woman walking her dog on a rural road in Napa County. Although there were no suspects, investigators did classify Vong Lei's death as a homicide. Vong's case was still open and unsolved. So it was hard for the detectives on her case not to think 
Michelle's was connected. It seemed like this could be another big break. There were just too many similarities. Were these types of women from Asian descent being targeted? Was this a hate crime of some kind? They weren't sure, but they wanted to look into it. And this was bittersweet news to Michelle's family because on one hand, this could be the break that they needed to find Michelle, but Fong had been found dead. And they didn't want Michelle's story to end that way. Nevertheless, they brought this information to the Hayward police, but the investigators said that they did not believe that these two cases were connected. They were just sad coincidences. Well, it felt like a slap in the face. Michelle's family believed that the Hayward Police Department didn't care about her because she was an adult. If Michelle had been a missing child, they believed her case would have been given way more priority. They refused to give up. They really needed to keep Michelle's name out there. So when the public interest in Michelle's disappearance began to go down, her uncle contacted a woman named Carrie Cave, formerly Carrie McGonagall. They needed her assistance. And I'd heard this name before, but I wasn't sure where. Well, Carrie McGonagall founded Team Amber Rescue to help find missing people in honor of her daughter, Amber Dubois. And you may have heard that name before. Sadly, little Amber disappeared on her way to purchase a lamb as a part of a farming program at Escondido High School back on February 23rd, 2009. She was only 14. That's another story I had on my list to dive into. It's a very sad story. But in summary, it did not end well. Amber was murdered. However, nobody knew that at the time. And just like in this case, her family held out hope that they would find her. Then almost exactly a year later on February 25th, 2010, another young girl named Chelsea King, who was only 17, went missing from a local hiking trail in Rancho Bernardo Park. And it wasn't long before her friends and family, just like Amber's, were searching all over for her. And sadly, they made a horrifying discovery. A pair of bloodied underwear and a sock were found only two miles from where Chelsea had parked her car. Then a shoe was found a mile from the clothes. It was a grim trail toward the ultimate discovery. After five days of searching, a dive team recovered Chelsea's body. And eventually, the man responsible for murdering Chelsea admitted that he did the same thing to poor Amber, and he led them to her body. These poor parents, it's senseless. These girls were just starting their lives. And after Amber's remains were located, her mother, Carrie, founded Team Amber Rescue. It helps her find peace because she provides other families with resources and expertise to help them find their loved ones, including her best tool, a dog, Amber, also named after her daughter. So when Michelle's uncle contacted Carrie, she agreed to come out to the search, but she also put them in touch with another search organization in Northern California run by her friend, Mark Class. His foundation is called Class Kids Foundation, and you could have guessed that he formed it for similar reasons. Because on October 1st, 1993, Mark Class's 12-year-old daughter, Polly Class, was kidnapped while having a sleepover at her own home. And that is terrifying. Mark and his family, like so many others, used every resource they could to find Polly. But just two months later, their worst nightmare became a reality. Her murderer was pulled over for a traffic violation. And it's at that point he was arrested. And after that, he led the police to Polly Class's body. Of course, you know that I wish I could go into detail about all three of those cases. And if you are interested, let me know. I can do a deep dive. Just put it in the comments. But Mark Class founded the Class Kids Foundation after the murder of his daughter, Polly, so that he could help families find their loved ones by providing a proven method. His techniques are tested, tried, and true. He runs a very organized search operation with a lot of rules and regulations that he's perfected over time for success. So both Mark and Carrie met with Michelle's family. They were in a hotel at the time, and it was a very sad moment. When Mark walked into that room, it was dark. You could just feel the sadness in the room. Everyone was just sitting there. They were just in their pajamas, looked like they hadn't even looked in the mirror in days. They were disheveled. They didn't know what to do. They were losing hope. However, what he knew he had to do was he had to attempt to mend the relationship between Michelle's family and the Hayward police. He knew all too well that they needed to cooperate if they wanted to get anywhere. 
They can't know where to search without some type of lead. And even though Michelle's loved ones had tried to cooperate, they were most likely too emotional and not asking the right questions. It's really hard. You don't think like an investigator because you are a loved one. But Mark explained to Michelle's relatives they needed the assistance of the authorities to find Michelle. There was obviously a lot that the police knew that the family did not. And the first thing Mark did was give everyone in Michelle's family a list of things to do. They needed to form a search party, to find volunteers, and he also taught them some key things about how searches work and how they can be the most successful. One of those things was to start from the center and work their way out because in most cases, people that go missing are found within one to five miles of where they were last seen. And Mark, being well-versed in working with the police, went to the Hayward Police Department to speak with the investigators. And it wasn't long before he built up a rapport. And finally, Inspector Ritchie, he was open to providing the family with much needed information. Of course, it couldn't hurt. The detectives needed any help they could get when it came to searching, especially if it meant additional resources. So he provided them with Michelle's cell phone ping locations. Michelle's phone had left a digital footprint after leaving the medical center's parking garage. The pings were traced throughout busy streets, then onto a very small two-lane road, and after that, it was tracked to a major freeway and then kind of out into the middle of nowhere, and then back to the medical center taking the same roads between 7.17 and 9.06 p.m. Following the roads and then making a five-mile radius meant that they would be going into some very rural areas, rugged terrain. This included canyons, rocky areas, streams, rivers, muddy banks, and it was already day 49 when this search started. They were searching a steep canyon area east of San Francisco Bay. It's called Niles Canyon in Sunol. This area is about a 25 minute drive from Kaiser Hospital. But as you can see, it is a much different terrain from this city. And I know we hear this a lot, but it truly is like trying to look for a needle in a haystack. To make sure that this search was organized and they used their time wisely, there was a system in place. As an area was thoroughly searched, they would tie a pink ribbon to a tree, and that would signify that the next searcher could go forward and not stop there to maximize their efforts. They also marked areas that were concerning, that they wanted the police to investigate, to look into, something that looked like it was evidence, but that was also hard because there was a lot of people living in this area that did not have homes. So they would come to this area to sleep and live, and there was a lot of debris, old food, garbage, and it was hard to differentiate between evidence and trash. And there were also areas where they would find things like a sleeping bag. It was scary. They didn't know what they were gonna find inside, but it turned out to be empty. When they went further into that area though, they found a bone a big bone, and it looked like it could be human. But then they found remains that indicated it was actually a large animal, so they moved on. However, there was more. When searchers were crossing a creek, they saw yet another very large bone. It looked like it could have been a thigh bone, and it also looked human. So they decided to fan out and look in this area for belongings that could be associated to a person. They found shorts and other articles, clothing, but nothing that looked like Michelle's clothing. It didn't match anything that they knew that she would have been wearing. However, they did send this bone in to be analyzed and it did come back human. But it belonged to someone that was about six feet tall and it had been there a long time, but it was sad to know that another person had ended up dead in this area. And it is the perfect place to put something that you don't want found, that's for sure. The search went on a long time. Two months had already passed since Michelle had gone missing, and though the family kept up their press conferences begging for Michelle's kidnapper to return her, they must have known that she wasn't alive, right? I mean, you're looking in a canyon. They couldn't have believed that Mark and his team were looking for Michelle camped out there or being held captive, but Mark never said that to them because he needed them to have hope inside. But it was true. Mark and his team were looking for Michelle's remains, what was left of the vibrant young woman that had so much life to live. And as the summer approached, the weather got hot. I'm talking like 100 degrees, especially where they were searching. So many of the volunteers, they called it quits. 
It was over 100 degrees, actually. And so far, any of the leads they thought they had, like a pair of pink shorts, for example, ended up leading them nowhere. Meanwhile, as I told you, the investigators from Hayward Police Department were doing searches of their own. They were still interviewing people, still analyzing evidence. And Richie had watched that video of Michelle walking to her car so many times, hundreds. And he noticed something. And this is so telling. Watch this. See how Michelle's walking in a straight line, just casually making her way to her car, which is off camera to the right? Look at this. Watch what she does when she gets to where it's parked. Look. She veers off to the left like she's trying to avoid something or someone. Then, as she gets maybe, I don't know, a comfortable distance, she stops. Why? Did she see someone? She have like an interaction with them before going towards her car? Well, Richie now believes that he knows what may have happened to her. He thinks that she makes her way to her car and someone's waiting for her. She saw them and she's taken by surprise. This person or persons must have said something that made Michelle at least feel like it was okay to walk toward her vehicle. Maybe she knew them. But once she got to that passenger side, she was attacked. This is apparent from the blood in the front seat of the passenger's area, the blood on the floor, but ultimately she was put inside the back passenger side of the car. This matches up with the smears on the parking garage floor, with the smears in the car, with the blood droplets. Everything matches up to that theory. So Richie thinks he may find more information by interviewing the students and the staff at Samuel Merritt in relation to instructors. How these instructors are granted access to certain areas of the campus. He was told that their badges are used as key cards to open doors and classrooms and designated areas where they're permitted to be. So remember the badge that was found in the front seat of Michelle's car? The adjunct instructor Elaine St. Augustine's badge? Well, this is another lead. Richie wants to pull any data linking this card that they found in Michelle's car to any door on the campus building. He wants to know any doors accessed on the day that Michelle went missing. So he goes to speak with the program's administrative assistant, Karen Casper. She was in charge of creating these ID badges, and she explained that the last time she saw that badge was actually the day before Michelle went missing, Thursday, May 26th. It was on her desk, along with the new hire folder with all of Elaine's paperwork. But then when Richie called and asked about it, she realized it was gone. So the security department ran a search and they were able to pinpoint when the badge was used first. And it was around 517 the evening prior to Michelle's disappearance. This is when I was in shock because everything was moving so quickly once they found this evidence. Everything is about to come together. And I'm telling you, this is a crazy story. It's a scary story. Colleges, at least modern ones, typically are places that have a lot of cameras, almost everywhere. So Richie asked the security team to pull the videos from the door that the badge was used on. They wanted to see who was using it. And sure enough, it's a woman matching the description of the picture on the ID. She had dark hair. It was pulled into a ponytail. The woman was wearing a hat and a scarf. And she also kind of resembled Michelle in a way. She was younger and it was hard to tell what she looked like because she wasn't facing the camera. Her back was turned. They couldn't see her face. She entered a back faculty door of the school with the key card. She makes her way up to where Michelle's nursing classes are held. Here she is. She's going through the faculty entrance. She's wearing black leggings, a dark colored shirt, and she's all alone. She wasn't following anyone. So could this be the new instructor getting acquainted with her new workplace? It looked like it could be. She goes in, she's just looking around. But then they see something odd. She's trying to open office doors and they're locked. So then she would move on to the next one, like trying each one of the doorknobs, making her way down the hall. And then at one point she spots someone else and she kind of backs up. This isn't normal. If she was permitted in this area, why would she be acting this way? It gave me the chills watching it. At first I thought, is it Michelle trying to sneak in, like change her grades because she wanted to get straight A's and did this instructor catch her? And did the instructor confront her in the parking lot the next day and something happen? It was really eerie seeing this footage. Who is this person? Well, she makes her way into a classroom and this time she kind of does seem casual and calm, sort of just checking out the space. Then she turns the lights off and leaves the room and when she returns, 
she doesn't even turn them back on. And now she's wearing a white lab coat and she's holding what looks like a clipboard with a class roster on it. It's looking more and more like this is the new instructor. She's there after hours checking out the class, but she's supposed to be in Hawaii. The investigator gets a good look at that paper in her hand and it was the class roster. They could see pictures of the students on it. And the woman's not doing anything weird or suspicious. I mean, unless this wasn't the instructor at all then it would be odd for some random person to be walking around the campus after hours checking computer screens, looking at the class roster, a roster that most certainly included Michelle Lay's picture and information on it, including her shifts at the Kaiser Hospital. So Richie's informed that Elaine San Augustine was indeed in Hawaii on May 26th and before Michelle even went missing. It couldn't have been her on that video footage. So this meant Whoever had that badge had stolen it. But how? And when? And why? They scrub through hours of footage until they spot the same woman earlier the same day. It was 8 a.m. First, the administrative assistant, Karen Casper, she opens the door to the front office. The woman comes inside. She's wearing the same black leggings. She has on a long sleeve, dark colored shirt. And this time her hair is down, but they still can't see her face. She's sitting on the couch waiting, and then all of a sudden, Karen walks out. That's when this girl walks right into her office, and there was definitely enough time for her to steal that badge. Then she walks out, and bam, she looks right into the camera while she's passing underneath, and they finally get a glimpse of her face. They study it. It's definitely a grainy video. Who do you think it looks like? I know you don't have an entire list of people that were friends of Michelle's, but she looks familiar to Richie and he thinks it's Giselle Esteban, but it's so hard to tell. I don't think I could identify who it is just by looking at this video, but perhaps they enhanced the footage. Right after this at 8.40 a.m., the camera spots her again. She's walking inside campus. Clearly, she's the one that stole the badge. Still, if this is Giselle, why? Would she steal a badge and aimlessly walk the halls of the school? Did Michelle tell her to do this? Or was she the one that harmed Michelle? Detectives don't know how that would be possible because this woman is only a little over five feet tall and pregnant. So Richie rules her out merely on size and stature. Take a look, this is what she looked like. Plus, he met her in person. He just didn't think that was a possibility. And if she was involved, she definitely had help. But this is the biggest lead that they have, so they have to run with it. So Richie thinks that perhaps Scott and Giselle concocted a plan to harm Michelle. They're really leaning towards Scott being the one that carried this out because he had enough strength to overpower Michelle easily and put her into her car. So they need to find him and ask him some very pressing questions. They also had some questions for the administrative assistant that interacted with this mystery woman who stole the badge. So they set out on those two objectives. So according to Karen, a prospective student came into the school around 8 a.m. and told her that she was interested in enrolling in the nursing program. She said that she had an appointment with the student services counselor, so Karen leaves to go locate that counselor, but she wasn't on campus that day. So Karen goes back to speak with the prospective student herself. Then afterward, the girl leaves. But we know that she didn't because we saw the footage of her going into that break room and walking around campus. Richie knew he needed to re-interview Scott, but before he had a chance to reach out to him, Scott gets in touch with Richie himself. It's May 29th and Scott calls him. He's like out of breath. And he tells the inspector that he's cleaning out his car and he just found what he thinks is Michelle's white iPhone under a back seat floor mat. Scott was instructed to turn the phone over to the police, which he did, and now Richie has a chance to go talk to him. He just happens to find Michelle's phone. It seems just a little too coincidental, don't you think? Is this some kind of ruse to come forward first so that they don't go looking for him? He considered Scott possibly trying to outsmart the police and maybe claiming someone's trying to set him up. Richie wasn't sure, but it was time to ask Scott a lot of questions, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I was definitely not ready for where this went. I've done a lot of cases. I was caught off guard. Scott explained a lot and a lot of things we already heard from Giselle, that he and Michelle had met through her, 
that they all went to college together back in 2003. When asked what the status of his relationship was with both women, he pretty much says he's got no relationship, none with Giselle, but that wasn't exactly true because he had a child with Giselle and he had just been texting Michelle. So he explains at this point that he tries to have as little contact with Giselle as possible, only what's necessary to facilitate their court-ordered visitations. Giselle's are chaperoned. That's what he tells Richie, and that's something Giselle did not mention. Scott says he now has full custody of their daughter, and he has ever since August of 2010. Recall that high-conflict parenting therapy session Well, that was due to the legal proceedings that the couple were going through at the time. And that was Scott's attempt to take Isabel away from Giselle. Richie wasn't sure what any of this had to do with Michelle yet, but it seemed at the very least that Scott needed to get all of this off his chest. So Richie took it all in and there was a lot. But Scott promised he was getting somewhere with all of these stories. In the beginning, he said that all three of them were very close friends. They hung out all the time. And he thought that Giselle and Michelle got along really well. He reiterated what Giselle said set her off in the first place, the time that Michelle confided in him about the fact she was pregnant. But Scott insisted he and Michelle were merely platonic. And Michelle was just going to him for advice that she wasn't ready to tell Giselle because of her pride, not because Scott was the father. Things seemed to blow over for a while with Giselle, but their relationship was off to a rocky start. It came to an end in 2005, but he was still sleeping with her at the time here and there. And that's when she told him she was pregnant with his baby and he tried to make it work with her, but it was a nightmare according to him, especially after the baby was born. It seemed as though she might've had something like postpartum depression, something set her off because all of a sudden she started to accuse Scott of hanging out with Michelle and once again, becoming upset over the belief that she had that they were more than friends. Scott, once again, tried to convince her otherwise, but the issue was that Scott just would not kick Michelle out of his life. He wasn't that kind of person. They have mutual friends within the Vietnamese community. Yet he did stop talking to her for a while upon Giselle's request. They were living together for three years, but their relationship was toxic and they separated for good in 2008. And at that point, Giselle had custody and a move away order So she took Isabel back to San Diego and Scott shared custody. He would go back and forth and visit his daughter as much as he could, which was a lot. As a matter of fact, he wanted full custody. And that decision came in 2009. Giselle said that she was going to move in with her new boyfriend and Isabel was coming with her and Scott wasn't okay with it. So he filed for full custody in November of 2009. This would take several months to go into the legal proceedings and get finalized. And by April 2010, Giselle had broken up with that new guy. She was living back in Northern California and she told Scott she was pregnant again, but having an abortion. And after this, Scott said he would backslide. He would sleep with her again. He just had a soft spot whenever she was in need, but they just could not have a relationship because they were toxic and they were both at fault in many instances. But he explained that Giselle had mental health conditions that made it nearly impossible to deal with her. He also told Richie that due to these apparent issues Giselle was facing, Michelle wanted nothing to do with her for a while. It was obvious that Giselle wanted someone to blame her breakup on and she felt like Michelle was just the perfect person. Scott explains, Michelle had nothing to do with it. It was Giselle's own behavior and her downward spiral over the years that made him leave. He said, I have seven years worth of domestic records involving Giselle. And that definitely sounded like a lot to deal with, but what does this have to do with Michelle? How does Michelle fit into all this? Was Scott suggesting that Giselle had something to do with what happened to Michelle over a relationship that ended four years ago? Because it wasn't really adding up. It was actually starting to make Scott look more suspicious. Almost as though he was trying to make excuses as to maybe why he had done something. So Richie wants to understand how Michelle fits in and what's Scott's current relationship with her look like. And that's when he admits he was hanging out with Michelle, especially more recently. And he was keeping it a secret from Giselle because he didn't want to deal with the drama. Even though back in August of 2010, it seemed as though with that meeting with the three of them at the therapist's office, that it provided closure, but Scott said it didn't. 
it only made things worse because remember they admitted to her, we were talking, we were hanging out, but we were just friends. That meant they were still lying. Giselle truly believed Michelle tore her family apart. It was actually after that meeting that she started to bombard Scott with really mean messages about Michelle, calling her all types of names and really sharing her hatred for her. Scott said that she was obsessed with Michelle. She was fixated on this fantasy where she could place all the blame on Michelle for her life not going well while Michelle's was thriving. It was more than jealousy. And I am not going to go into seven years worth of reports between Scott and Giselle, but in order for Richie to understand who Giselle was, it was imperative that he go through all of them. I'm gonna highlight a few. And these were reported by both Giselle and Scott. It was back and forth and back and forth. So toxic, so much drama. No wonder people wanna stay single sometimes. For example, in 2008, Giselle had swallowed an excessive number of pills and then attacked Scott, hitting him in the stomach, and there was a witness to this. So Giselle was arrested. But then the same year, Scott was arrested for pushing Giselle through a doorway and endangering his daughter, who was present for this altercation. But then another time, Giselle destroyed Scott's computer. But then he was the initial aggressor, according to the report. Giselle would constantly threaten to harm herself if Scott didn't answer her texts or her calls or come see her. This is why he couldn't get away, he said. He would leave her for a while and then something would happen, some crisis, and he would have to come to her rescue. One time, she called him crying, begging for him to come over, saying that she had her finger on the trigger and she didn't want to pull it. Wow. She would even lay in the middle of the road while there were cars coming and he would sit there yelling for her to get up And she wouldn't, and he had to physically grab her and throw her to the side of the road, and that is scary. And on one hand, I think it's easy for us to judge her and call her crazy, but clearly this woman needed help. She was hurting, and Scott wanted to be there for the mother of his child, even though he didn't want to be with her. He was stuck between, like they say, a rock and a hard place. She would constantly get him arrested by claiming she was a battered woman, And the cops would believe her because she had marks all over her body, marks that she made. So Richie begins to feel bad for Scott. He's been through a lot, especially at such a young age. But it doesn't mean that he's not trying to get back at Giselle by implicating her in Michelle's case. But Scott finally says, I have nothing to do with Michelle's disappearance. And that none of these domestic issues have ever been prosecuted in a court of law, so no one has ever been determined to be guilty. They're merely reports. He just wanted to prove you know, that he was a good guy, that he's not really guilty of any of these things. It's just he said, she said. He wanted to show Richie that Giselle has the ability to be violent and that she's not this sweet, innocent, little, petite, pregnant girl with a kid. If there's anyone that Giselle would have her eyes set on to harm, he believes it would be Michelle. But Richie wants to know why. And Scott explains that just a few months ago, Giselle had become increasingly obsessed over Michelle and he has proof. He pulls out his phone. Scott had started to record conversations, screenshot text messages, anything he could because he was becoming more and more afraid of Giselle. These are some of the items he used as evidence to get custody of his daughter. It started back in November of 2010. Scott played a voice recording for Richie that he had saved. It was an argument between him and Giselle. She was once again rehashing the accusation that Scott and Michelle had slept together and that he had driven her to get this abortion. We're talking about something that occurred years ago, but she was acting as though it happened the day before. And Scott, he's sitting there trying to remain calm, but it is very hard to do so. But this was seven months ago. But Scott's like, wait, there's more. And I know this is a lot, but I think it's really important to understand everything in its entirety. That's why I locate the legal documents so I can really understand each case and the timeline. So on February 17, 2011, this is just three months before Michelle goes missing, Giselle asked Scott to meet her at a coffee shop and things were okay until Giselle brings up this story about how someone has this big problem with Michelle and that Giselle is finally going to let this person know where they can find her and teach her a lesson, that type of thing. She tells Scott that this person's going to go to a party where Michelle's at and they're going to use something to disfigure her like acid or a weapon. Well, Scott doesn't want to hear any of this. He's terrified. So he refused to discuss it any further. And that's when 
Giselle literally throws a coffee at him. Yeah. And then later that night, she's begging him for forgiveness. She's acting as though she was the victim. The victim of Scott's poor choices, as she liked to call it. She told him that she was still angry about what he did with Michelle and that she hadn't even begun to forgive them. That same night, Scott became aware that Giselle sent a text to both him and Michelle. And this is what the one to Michelle said. It said, quote, If you really were anyone's friend, mine or Scott's, you would just F off and leave my family alone. But all you are is a whore who had nothing better to do and follow me to San Francisco. That's all you'll ever be, the whore who slept with other people's men and brothers because no one wanted you. You aren't my friend. You are always just a parasite, end quote. Just seconds later, Giselle sent a text to both Scott and Michelle, which said, you two really do deserve each other. I hope you get what you deserve. You are both pathetic. You, Scott, with no dreams or goals, and the other chasing after someone else's dreams because she has none of her own. You are both parasites. But in reality, Giselle was projecting her own behavior. She had given up on her dreams. She didn't have any goals other than seemingly making other people's lives miserable. And it was truly sad. Michelle had better things to do at this point than respond to this nonsense. So she ignored Giselle's texts and calls. Well, this didn't make Giselle very happy. The very next day on February 18th, she sent Scott a number of messages about Michelle, calling him an idiot and to stop falling for Michelle's act. She warned him that Michelle better stop avoiding her calls because this won't end unless she does. But it didn't end there. She told him that their daughter was already aware that he had picked his whore over his family and went on to complain that Scott hadn't even given her a birthday present. Yet instead, he decided to blow his money on his whore. And because of all of this, Giselle took the liberty of letting Michelle's boyfriend know all about their history. Jeez, I mean, I don't know. It does sound like high school drama. And Michelle, that was another thing. She had a serious boyfriend this whole time. She dated Tommy for years while this was going on. And by the end of February, Giselle was continuing to send nasty messages to Scott. She told him that he had pushed her into insanity and that he would have to live with the consequences for the rest of his life. She threatened Michelle's life by telling Scott he wasn't going to be able to protect anyone, that his whore will get what she deserves too, and that she had many ways to make him pay for what he had done. She even told him that maybe he should just get it over with and put a bullet in his own head. Because with him dead, their world would be a better place. He and Michelle would pay for their mistakes, and that she was busy planning his demise. The thing is, I told you, Scott was hanging out with Michelle, and Giselle was watching them. She followed them to places and she knew they were together. And that only made this worse. If someone's telling you they're not doing something, but they really are, I don't know, some people call it gaslighting or worse, you can start to feel like you're going crazy. But maybe Giselle really was. In March, she told Scott that she had seen him and Michelle together. She asked him, why do you keep lying? And like I said, to be fair, he was lying. And he admitted that to Richie. He was lying because he didn't want to deal with the drama, but it didn't matter whether he hung out with Michelle or not because Giselle was already of the mindset that they had always been in a relationship behind her back. She texted him saying that Michelle dug her grave by being a homewrecker and a whore, but that she won't be an issue for long. She told Scott, you keep seeing your whore. I tried every positive approach and you still keep running back to the whore who made you lie to your family. So now I choose to take the negative and obliterate you and your baggage toting whore from my family. You'll never have a good name again. My question is why not go to the police with all this like a long time ago if this person's threatening your life and someone else's life? And I promise there's just a few more of these instances, but they just get closer and closer to the time that Michelle goes missing. On March 17th, Giselle texted, FYI, she won't pass her midterms. That's such an eerie thing to say since we know that she's gone now. 
and on March 18th, Scott drove over to Giselle's apartment. He's going to pick up some Girl Scout cookies. He had ordered them from his daughter, and Giselle was supposed to leave them outside because he did not want to have a confrontation with her. But that's not what happened because when he pulls up, he's got his little girl in the car with him. She's waiting. She gets into the passenger side of his car, and he knew he was going to have to record this conversation. He just knew it wasn't going to go well. He could sense it. And their little daughter is in the car with them. And like many times before, Giselle used what had made Scott break. What made him have a soft spot for her, she said, I'm pregnant with your baby. Now, she actually was pregnant, but Scott didn't believe it. Then Giselle goes right into the conversation about Michelle again. She told Scott she tried reasoning with him in a nice way, but he's still seeing Michelle more than he's even seeing her. In this recording, Giselle is heard saying, I asked you if you could just be honest about Michelle because she is the one issue I'm really having a hard time dealing with. And it was like, fine, okay, starting now, we're going to be honest about Michelle, whether you sleep with her, you share food with her, whether you talk to her. And then suddenly... Giselle yelled, look at me. Be honest with me regarding her. Otherwise, I will take her life and yours. And you can take that to the grave with you. All Scott could say was, why? And Giselle responded, because you lied about her so many times. It's just hard to believe you didn't sleep with her. You deserve to die for your lies. And so does she if you do this again. This is your last and final warning. And this was chilling. I have some of this recording to play for you. I asked you, can we just be honest about Michelle because she's the one issue that I really, really am having a hard time dealing with. That's not what you said at yes. all. Yes. Okay, we well then fine. The Starting from now, we are going to be honest about Michelle. Do you understand me? Whether you sleep with her, whether you share food with her, whether you talk to her, you will be honest with me. Look at me. You will be honest with me regarding her. Otherwise, I will take your life and hers. And you can take that to the grave with you. Why? Why? Because you lied about her so many times, it's hard to believe that you can sleep with her and lock her up. You deserve to die for your lies, as does she. And you will. If you do it again, this is your last ever warning. Why? Do you understand me? It's your last and final one. Her daughter could be heard in the background, her little voice. She said, mommy. And then you just hear Giselle change her tone, saying, yes, honey, what's wrong? Then she tells her impressionable daughter, mommy doesn't like being lied to. That's really sad. And then Giselle asked Scott if he loved her. And man, this guy had some guts. But he was honest and he told her no. Well, after this, Giselle started to punch herself in the face over and over again with her keys. And Scott was pleading for her to stop. This is in front of their daughter. And he threatened to call the police and she's like, go ahead, because they're gonna end up arresting you anyway. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. But the charges were dropped. They were dismissed like they were so many other times in the past. But this next part is crucial to listen to. It's where Richie really gets a sense of a pattern of Giselle's behavior and things start to add up for him. On May 20th, just a week before Michelle goes missing, Giselle goes over to Scott's to pick up Isabel for a supervised visit. I'm sure you've heard of this before, but this is where you have to be with a social worker. And that person was supposed to be there to make sure things went smoothly, but they couldn't stop Giselle. She walked right past them into Scott's house where he was living with his parents. And she was acting very erratic. She was causing a scene, upsetting everyone. She finally leaves, but then Scott realizes his car keys are missing. And now that's a very important part of this incident because that's what led Richie to believe the possibility that Giselle may have planted Michelle's phone in Scott's car if Scott was telling the truth because he's only heard Scott's version of these events so far. Scott said that two days later on May 22nd, he's woken up really early in the morning by the sound of his car alarm going off out of nowhere. It's eight o'clock in the morning. And when he goes out to investigate, he goes outside, looks around, and he doesn't see anything and he stops. When he hears his mom screaming, he turns and he runs back inside and he sees Giselle coming out of his bedroom at this point. His mom had actually come down while Scott was outside and she saw Giselle standing inside her granddaughter's bedroom. So she yells to Giselle, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. Giselle turns around, she's like, 
kind of thinking this is funny, like it's comical. And she's like, I'm just messing with your son. And that's when she runs into Scott's bedroom. By the time he gets there, he sees her running outside and he follows her to his gate out in the back or the front. And she's laughing. He says, give me my keys. And she said, I don't have them. Well, later he finds out not only did she probably steal his keys, but she had hacked into his computer. Any emails that he had ever sent between him and Michelle, they were forwarded to Giselle's email address and then deleted from his computer. All of his court-related files pertaining to her and anything that had Giselle's name on it was missing. It was in that moment Scott decided to apply for a restraining order against Giselle. And his parents came with him to the courthouse and they made statements in regard to this incident because they wanted to protect Scott and their granddaughter. Richie asked if Scott had any recent contact with Giselle, to which he said, sort of. So Scott explains that at one o'clock in the morning, the night Michelle disappeared, Giselle texted Scott with, where is Michelle? He was asleep and he didn't respond. And later that morning, Giselle was late to pick up Isabel from Scott's house for another supervised visit. Richie realized it was time to bring Giselle back into the station for more extensive questioning. They also wanted to get a copy of her phone record. So Giselle comes in, they kind of go back over everything we already talked about, and they ask her when was the last time she spoke to Michelle. Giselle said that she had called Michelle several times in the days leading up to when she was reported missing. And she left messages, but none of them were ever answered. Richie wanted to know the reasons for these calls, considering Giselle was no longer really hanging out with Michelle at this point. And Giselle explained it was to make sure she was staying away from Isabel. Richie asked if Michelle had something that was going on. She was interfering with her child or getting into her business somehow. And Giselle said no. It was just that Michelle would surface every now and then, and she would hear about it from her five-year-old daughter. Interesting. So Richie asked to see her call log. She had a red BlackBerry Curve cell phone. And that's when she explains, oh, well, you, you may not find any messages to Michelle because I have them automatically deleted. And then she further explained that the reason she may have some copies of some older messages that she sent to other people was because she manually saved them. And I, I've never heard of this feature on a phone. Correct me if I'm wrong. I've also never really liked Blackberry, so I'm not sure. Richie asked Giselle what she was doing the evening that Michelle went missing. And she said she had a very boring day. She took a walk that evening because she was feeling a little restless. She talked on the phone with her friend Virgeli. And after that, she eventually fell asleep on the couch. Okay, so Richie was like, what about during the daytime? Giselle said that that morning she went to volunteer at Isabel's school. Then she came home and took a nap. And around 4.15, she decided to go over to the hospital in her area, Kaiser Union City location, to talk about her pregnancy coverage because she was pregnant with Scott's baby. Wow, wait a minute. This is all really interesting. So she explained that the location near her was closed. So she went to the closest one, which was Hayward location. And that's the one that Michelle worked at. So Richie thinks this is very interesting. She said that she parked on the parking lot on the third floor, which is in the maternity ward, since that's where she was headed to check on, you know, everything she needed for her upcoming pregnancy appointments. But once she got inside, she realized that the member services department was closed. So she just, used the bathroom real fast, and then she went back to her car and went home. She admits without prompting that she sees Michelle walking on the pedestrian bridge. She wasn't close enough to know for sure if it was her, but she was pretty sure. So Richie asks, well, what time was that? Giselle says, oh, I don't know, 6, 6.30 maybe. This put Giselle in the same parking lot around the same time Michelle had gone to her car, the last time she was seen before she disappeared. So Richie asked if there was any type of encounter with Michelle. And that's when Giselle was like, do I need to talk to an attorney or something? Richie said, you're not under arrest. We're not accusing you of anything. We're just asking questions. Well, Giselle wasn't so confident about that and asked whether they were talking to anyone else because Michelle, according to Giselle, had slept with a lot of people's boyfriends. Wow. It's like she can't help but bash this poor girl. Richie said, well, they had all the footage of that parking garage and they could go through it at the exact time that she said she was there. He said, is it gonna show any kind of confrontation with you and Michelle? And she's like, 
I don't know. She said she couldn't recall ever having a discussion or an altercation of any kind that she kind of doesn't know much about those days. And she was already in her car when she spotted Michelle on that bridge. She got home around 7 p.m. and texted some friends. Richie was like, you realize that you're at her workplace and she goes missing. You know how that looks, right? And she admitted, yeah, the circumstances looked bad, obviously. But she said she doesn't know what happened to Michelle or where she is. So Richie admitted that he was having trouble believing how little Giselle remembered about what happened that day. She said that she'd been off her medication because she was pregnant. Now, this is where things get very interesting. It's true. When you're pregnant, doctors will sometimes take you off of certain medications, especially ones that are prescribed for mental health ailments, but they usually have to weigh the pros and cons of doing so. So Richie wanted to know what medications are you on and what are they for? Giselle says lithium, but that she doesn't know what her diagnosis was. I'm sorry, but who doesn't know their own medical diagnosis? That seemed very odd. But being off a much needed medication is concerning. Putting the timeline together, it would mean that Giselle could have stopped her meds around February or March and recall that a lot of this aggressive behavior in relation to Scott and Michelle began in and around February. The texts, the threats, the behavior that Scott relayed to investigators. Now granted, yes, they have had altercations in the past, but it's just something that they pointed out to note. Richie told her that if there was some kind of fight, now would be a good time to tell him about it. And she responded that she didn't know and that she does not know what happened to Michelle. She had been sleeping a lot lately and forgetting a lot of things. And that's when he used a tactic where you lie to someone. You're allowed to do this when they're being questioned to elicit information about a crime. So he says that he has footage of Giselle's car driving past Michelle's car. And Giselle's like, yeah, I probably did. But I had no idea that Michelle even worked there until after I saw her walking across the bridge. And by that time, Giselle said she was already leaving to go back home. At this point, Richie is in the process of getting a warrant to search Giselle's apartment, her car, and he really wanted to know if they were gonna find anything of Michelle's inside. And she's like, I I'm pretty sure you're not. Pretty sure you're not gonna find anything of my previous BFF inside my home. And he asked her what she did on Saturday. And she said she took her daughter to Chuck E. Cheese's. Then she stopped talking so she could text someone. And apparently it was her friend, Virgeli. And they were advising her by text to stop talking to the police. And Giselle says, my friend is telling me, you know, I have an alibi and I should stop talking to you now. And she was laughing when she was sharing this with Richie. He said, why would someone not want you to help the police find a missing person? And Giselle explained that her and her friend, they did not trust the police because they had been in situations where the police never helped them when they were both victims of domestic altercations. Giselle also suggested that maybe Michelle didn't want to be found. Do you ever think of that? Maybe Michelle's not really missing. And if the police were really looking for her, they should go do it instead of sitting there questioning her. She did become a little emotional and she said she didn't want Michelle to be gone. And even though they weren't really friends, that she was never really a friend, she wasn't an enemy either. However, while Richie is going through her call log, she explained that her and Michelle did used to have text wars before she changed her number. And that's when Richie sees two calls that Giselle made to the Kaiser Hospital where Michelle works. And he asked Giselle about these calls and she said, yeah, I made two calls to the member services about my insurance coverage for my pregnancy. And that's when Richie asked if Giselle had called Kaiser the day before Michelle went missing looking for Michelle. She's like, no, I, I went there to ask about the nursing program. I don't recall asking about the nursing students, but Richie assured her that the calls were recorded so he would just check the records. Damn, I was so invested at this point. I'm like, this girl's so connected to this crime. It's obvious. And now Richie had a call log showing that Giselle, who says she merely went to the hospital to check on her maternity benefits, actually called there the day before asking about the nursing program. She's not even graduated from college. So that would be very premature. And it's way too much of a coincidence way too much. The interview was about to wrap up because Richie knew he needed to look into a lot of what Giselle had just told him, but he wanted to know one thing. He asked, what did Michelle do or say that was so bad that would prompt them to have text wars and such? And Giselle said that just being around her daughter was not okay. 
because her daughter was getting the impression that Michelle was her new mommy. Then Richie asked about the reason Scott's mom had issues with Giselle, enough to actually assist him in getting this restraining order, to which Giselle replied, oh, Scott's mom is just trying to keep her son out of jail, which is something that she did all the time. Richie just had a couple more things to cover his bases. He asked Giselle if she had ever been in Michelle's new car. She said she didn't remember, but she didn't think so because she didn't even know Michelle had a new car. At this point, Giselle was free to go, but they had gotten her entire call log and they were able to download her phone records as well as a warrant to search her apartment and a DNA swab for comparison to any DNA that they might find. By now, Richie believes it was Giselle who they saw in that video footage and that she was the one that stole the badge, used it to enter the campus, stole the roster with all that information about when and where Michelle would be the next day. And this is one of my favorite parts. It's when they really start to piece together all the evidence. Because even if they have a hunch, that's never good enough. They need concrete proof. So since they have Giselle's phone records and call log, they can make a timeline of where her phone was. And those records show that Giselle made several calls to both Samuel Merritt and Kaiser starting on Wednesday, May 25th. She placed two calls to the nursing school. Then the next day, on Thursday the 26th, when the badge was taken, she called Kaiser at 10.45 a.m. and then again at 2.30 p.m. A priest who worked at All Saints Catholic Church in Hayward, California, had sent in a tip in regard to Michelle's case. He said on May 26, the day before Michelle went missing at 3 p.m., he sees a young woman sitting on a patio outside his office. She was wearing white medical scrubs and she looked upset. When the priest asked the woman several times if she wanted to go into the confessional, she said no, which is why he was able to speak with the investigator. She simply said that she was there to ask for forgiveness and she needed it for something she hadn't done yet. Wow, this was the day before. Then on the afternoon of February, May 27th, the day that Michelle was last seen, Giselle made another call to Kaiser. And not only that, Giselle actually used her phone while inside the Kaiser Hayward parking structure on May 26th at 4.12 p.m., 4.32 p.m., and 8.55 p.m. And then on May 27th, the day Michelle disappeared from work, Giselle's cell phone was in the Kaiser parking garage when she used it to send 91 text messages between the hours of 3.11 p.m. and 7.12 p.m. Wow. Now Richie goes to Kaiser to ask the staff about these calls. And this I found so frightening and so interesting. There's no question, right? But to build their case, Richie has to know what the context of these calls were. Were they to Michelle? Because remember, Michelle changed her number. So was Giselle trying to reach out to her in another way? However, Giselle said she didn't even know Michelle worked at Kaiser. Remember that statement? Until she saw her on Friday night walking along that pedestrian bridge. So that means it was just a coincidence that Giselle was calling to find out about her insurance benefits, right? We're about to find out because Richie asked the staff at both the nursing school and Kaiser. Since Richie had all of Giselle's texts, I created a timeline of these days from May 25th to the days following Michelle's disappearance. On Wednesday, May 25th, Scott went to the courthouse to file for that restraining order. Well, Giselle's GPS shows that she actually followed him there. She sat outside watching. And sometimes I think that these restraining orders do more harm than good. Sometimes it's what pushes someone over the edge and honestly, they usually don't work very well. Many times they're not enforced, at least with the cases that I've read. Recall Tiana Notice, and if you haven't seen that devastating case, it's linked up here below and at the end of this video. But after this, Giselle sends several text messages to a guy named Alan. He's a friend from college who knows Michelle, and Giselle's asking for Michelle's new address. She's telling Alan, that his girlfriend might have it, but don't tell his girlfriend or Michelle that she wanted it because she was trying to serve some restraining order papers to Michelle to stay away from her daughter. And these papers keep getting returned from Michelle's Oakland address because apparently she has moved. Creepy. That evening, Alan responded 
that neither him or his girlfriend had Michelle's new address. The same day, Giselle calls the nursing school twice, and Richie takes a statement from Marjorie Villanueva, a school administrator, and she said she remembers a woman calling in. Her name was Jamie, and she sounded sweet. She was nice. She was friendly. She was calm. She said, I'm at the airport. I'm supposed to get together with my friend, Michelle Lay. She's like, can I, can I have her phone number? And of course, this administrator was like, no. So Jamie calls back again, asking the same thing for Michelle's phone number. And once again, the administrative assistant said no. But she did say, let me get your number, Jamie, and I'll give this to Michelle. But the caller said that she was borrowing a phone. At this point, the admin left a message for Michelle that her friend Jamie was looking for her, and I wonder if that message was ever given to her. But the next morning, May 26 at 8 a.m., is when the campus video footage catches Giselle going to supposedly talk to a counselor about the school. It was at this point she steals the badge and then walks around campus into the break room down the halls before finally leaving. And then at 10.34, she calls Kaiser. The call is answered by Scott Moore, who's a charge nurse in the emergency department. The caller said that she was Michelle Lay and that she had just started an internship on Friday. And the caller just sounded so desperate to know the instructor's name and where she was supposed to report. But this call was weird because nursing students normally get this information from their school. So we told the woman on the phone that Michelle was not scheduled to work in the emergency department that Friday. It was as though Giselle was just checking things off of her list. Like, oh, she's not going to be in the emergency department. She's going to be another one. A few hours later, the woman called back and pretty much asked the same questions. Then again, at 2.30 p.m., the third call comes in from Giselle's cell phone to Kaiser. This was answered by a nurse, Bessie Wentz. And the caller says, I'm a skilled lab instructor for Samuel Merritt, and I need some information about the nursing students if they're going to be there that night. And Wentz confirmed that the students were there every Thursday and Friday, but she wouldn't provide any names of students who would be attending. Wow. This is so calculated, but of course I'm not done yet. The same day, her phone pings, Giselle's, at the Kaiser garage at 4.12 p.m., 4.32 p.m., and 8.55 p.m. She's in the garage at those times. Then the next day, on Friday, May 27th, the day Michelle actually goes missing from Kaiser, Nurse Scott Moore receives another phone call regarding Michelle. Giselle called once again, this time pretending to be an instructor from Merritt. She said she needed to arrange a meeting with Michelle Lay. But Moore knew the name that she had just given was Michelle's previous instructor, and they weren't working that day, and he knew the person, and this definitely wasn't them calling. So he thought this call was very odd. The caller went on to tell him, that Michelle was actually on probation, which was something that schools usually kept completely confidential, so he knew this wasn't even someone calling from the school. The caller was trying to confirm that Michelle was going to report for her program at 7 p.m. that night. And Moore told the caller that 7 p.m. wasn't necessarily the start time because programs can start earlier in the afternoon. That was the day that Giselle sent 91 text messages from that parking lot between the hours of 3.11 p.m. and 7.12 p.m. Now remember Michelle's car was seen in the parking garage sometime around 9 p.m. And around that same time, Giselle sends her friend Brian a text. It says, do you know how to unlock an iPhone? She explained that she found one earlier that day at the Kaiser Pharmacy. Lies, all lies. And Richie knows this, I'm sitting here stunned have you ever experienced anyone like that? What do you even call this behavior? It's stalking, right? But I feel like there's got to be another name for it. Something that really defines the jealousy, the hatred, the calculation. It's scary. Maybe premeditation. But let's continue, shall we? Investigators theorized that Giselle caused Michelle's death. But they needed to prove it. And without Michelle's body, that was extremely challenging. The police pulled Michelle's phone records and they reviewed her pings from the night that she disappeared and they compared them to where Giselle's phone had pinged. And as suspected, Giselle and Michelle's phone left the parking garage at the same time and they tracked together on that same exact path through town, out into the canyon, and then back at the parking garage. 
and then to the final place that Michelle's car was parked. But then Michelle's phone stopped tracking. It was either turned off or it died. However, they continued to follow Giselle's movement in the days following Michelle's disappearance. Her phone pinged at Scott's residence, where we know he said that she came for a supervised visit. Then it tracks to the Apple store at a mall nearby. Richie goes there and he pulls that footage and he speaks to employees. And sure enough, one of the employees remembers Giselle. He says she came in, she was with her young daughter and she said that her daughter was playing with the phone and that somehow her daughter accidentally put a passcode on it and now they're locked out. Unbelievably, in my opinion, this Apple employee unlocked this phone for Giselle. According to Michelle Lay's phone records, the moment that the Apple employee unlocked the phone, her phone turned back on and was pinging at a tower near the Apple store. The employee also mentioned that he recalled just how many notifications were coming through on the phone. As soon as it turned on, it was going crazy with notifications. Here's that footage, the surveillance camera. You can see Giselle and her daughter in the stroller with a social worker. That social worker had chaperoned that visit that day. You see Giselle walk up and talk to an Apple employee. Then she leaves the store with a white phone in her hand. And according to an interview with that social worker, Giselle told her that her brother gave her that iPhone and that she needed to go get it set up at the Apple store. The social worker also explained that once they left the Apple store, Giselle had asked her to drive. And the entire time on their way to Chuck E. Cheese, all she did was text the whole way there. This was most likely when everyone was getting those responses back for Michelle's phone. And at 3 p.m., both phones tracked to Chuck E. Cheese where the social worker, along with Giselle, her daughter, Isabel, and her nieces were. However, Giselle hardly paid any attention to the children and said, she gets up and she leaves the kids with the social worker. She tells her, I left something burning on the stove in my apartment. I have to run back and go turn it off. The social worker said that Giselle returned in less than an hour and she no longer had the white iPhone. However, Giselle's phone pinged near Scott's house. There was one other place her phone pinged that piqued Richie's interest. On the day of the candlelight vigil, Giselle's phone pinged right near where Michelle's friends and family were gathering, including Scott. She never got out of her car to pay respects or to support the family. She obviously just drove around watching. Here are some photos from the search that they conducted on Giselle's apartment. They collected a number of items, including a pair of white shoes that were seen in video footage of Giselle. And they were also shoes that Giselle had kind of been adamant about wearing out of her apartment when they initially interviewed her. So Richie definitely wanted them analyzed. Giselle was kept under surveillance. A tracker was put on her car and they monitored her whereabouts as they awaited those DNA results because that could take weeks. But eventually, the Hayward Police Department received the DNA results from Michelle's vehicle and Giselle's shoes. And according to those results, Giselle's DNA was found on the turn signal of Michelle's car. A black hair on the passenger seat matched to Giselle's DNA. However, that evidence alone was not enough to charge Giselle with Michelle's murder. However, not soon after this, they received those results from testing Giselle's shoes. Michelle's blood was found on them. And they knew at this point, they definitely had enough evidence to arrest Giselle for the murder of Michelle Lay. But they weren't sure they would have enough to secure a guilty verdict at trial, since they still did not have Michelle's body to prove that she was indeed deceased. They were fearful for Scott and his daughter's safety and for Michelle's family's safety because Giselle had already visited Isabel's school in defiance of that restraining order and she even tried to enter her classroom. So Scott told the police, the disregard of the restraining order makes me fearful that Giselle may be increasingly unstable and that she had been diagnosed with manic depression and it had psychotic features as well as a form of bipolar disorder. So the police decided to make an arrest in order to know where Giselle was at any given moment as they build their case against her. September 7, 2011, three months after Michelle disappeared, the Hayward Police Department arrested Giselle Esteban at her apartment. She didn't fight, she didn't argue. She just put her hands behind her back. She never even asked why she was being arrested. I mean, obviously she knew. She just remained as cold as ice. She didn't show any remorse. 
Of course, not knowing the details about the evidence investigators have found, Michelle's family was stunned. Of all people, Michelle's best friend from high school was being arrested for her murder? Especially because they were still holding out hope that Michelle was still alive. There was no body found, so there wasn't closure. At this point, the reward offered was up to $100,000 for Michelle's return or information about her whereabouts. But now the family was able to know details. They were called to the police department and they were told everything. And it made sense. They saw everything. They saw Giselle in the lab coat, at the school, the DNA, the Apple store footage. It was just too much. And I hate this part of these stories, but you know what's coming. It was September 17th, 113 days after Michelle had gone missing and just 10 days after they arrested Giselle. Carrie and her dog, Amber, were combing through the canyon area on one of their searches. It was an area where Giselle and Michelle's phone were stationary for at least 20 to 30 minutes on the night of the disappearance. And Carrie let the search dog, Amber, off the leash. She was acting really, really odd. She was just jumping all over the place, and the dog obviously wanted to get away from Carrie, so she just let her loose. And a few seconds later, the dog returned, and she wanted Carrie to follow her, so she did. When she looked near a large tree stump, she saw what appeared to be white medical scrubs. And when she got closer, Carrie saw what she believed looked like human remains, but all that was left was a skeleton. The body was severely decomposed and it could not be identified merely by looking at it. They couldn't even tell if it was a male or female. The authorities were notified and the remains were transported to the medical examiner's office for an official identification. What's sad is that Christine, she was back at the command post and she gets a phone call from a reporter, an insensitive one at that. And they're calling to get a comment from her on the discovery of Michelle's remains. And she was in shock. Christine told the reporter they didn't find Michelle, but something in her gut told her that they had. The identification took a couple days. Dental records were used. And once again, Christine was just holding on, holding on to that hope until they had proof that those remains belonged to her favorite cousin. But by the evening of Monday, September 19th, just two days after the remains were found, the Alameda County Coroner's Bureau confirmed that they had found the remains of missing nursing student Michelle Lay. But the forensic pathology examinations were still ongoing and they could not determine the exact manner or cause of death yet. Following confirmation that the remains were Michelle's, her family stayed in their hotel room just to mourn her death. It was unbelievable to them. You never think anything like this is going to happen. Ultimately, Michelle's cause of death could never be determined because her body was too decomposed. However, the theory is that a sharp object like a knife was used to render Michelle unable to fight back against Giselle. She was most likely wounded in the neck or the chest, somewhere that would incapacitate her very quickly. Giselle was indicted on December 14, 2011, and she entered a plea of not guilty. The trial date was set for September 17, 2012. Giselle's defense attorney was Andrea Auer, and the prosecutor on the case was Butch Ford. He was determined to dig up all he could on Giselle. And one of the pieces of evidence that I found interesting was there were over 300 pages of text messages between Scott and Giselle alone in regard to Michelle. Wow. So the prosecutor listened to the recordings of Scott and Giselle's conversations. He read over all those pages of text messages as part of his investigation. And he concluded that Giselle hated her former best friend for at least six years, according for what he can put together from all of the evidence. A senior computer forensic examiner employed by the FBI recovered all of the data from a hard drive on one of Giselle's computers. And she had conducted over 300 searches on the internet for the name Michelle Lay. Other searches included, is there a certain chemical that can induce a heart attack without leaving a trace? Or how to find someone who doesn't want to be found? How to follow someone without getting caught? How to induce a heart attack? And where to buy potassium chloride? Clearly, this was completely premeditated. Two psychiatric evaluations have been done. They were filed in that custody dispute between Scott and Giselle and it said that she had a history of depression and included details about an incident when she was in her 20s. Her friend said that they called 911 after they found her asleep near an empty bottle of antidepressants, but Giselle denied overdosing. Both of these psychiatric evaluations were done in the summer of 2010, 
and they found that she was not a danger to herself or others. This was around the same time that that meeting was facilitated between her, the therapist, Michelle, and Scott. However, Scott relayed to the prosecutor that in the months leading up to the murder, Giselle took out a knife and threatened to use it on herself and her unborn child, which she claimed was his, if he didn't leave Michelle alone. Giselle was indeed pregnant. That was not a lie. She actually gave birth the week before Thanksgiving in 2011 following her arrest. She had a son, but it was not Scott's child. Scott was made aware of this, and that's how they know when Giselle gave birth. The child was put into the father's custody, and both Giselle and her attorney were very careful not to provide any information about her son's identity. The opening arguments began October 1, 2012, and Prosecutor Butch Ford presented the case to the jury as a devastating case of premeditated murder. He said Giselle had a motive. Her life was in shambles. She lost custody of her daughter, and out of jealousy, Giselle wanted to murder her beautiful, smart, loving friend, Michelle, out of revenge for her belief that Michelle had broken up her family. Giselle's attorney acknowledged that Giselle indeed killed Michelle, but she argued it was not murder. It was voluntary manslaughter, not first degree murder, not premeditated, and that it was Michelle's own fault, essentially, that she was killed because she provoked Giselle into committing the killing in a heat of passion. And I can't disagree more. Come on. There's so much evidence here, so much planning, so much calculation. And that is what the prosecutor was able to show. And I mean, there were recordings of Giselle laughing while talking about wanting to kill people. And then she actually did. But Giselle's attorney wanted the jury to convict her of manslaughter because she was bipolar and not taking her medication at the time of the murder. Her attorney stated that Giselle's texts prove that she had a fragile mental state, that she was paranoid, and she was in psychosis, and that put her over the edge. According to Giselle, after a conversation with Michelle in that garage, Michelle provoked her, and Giselle killed her former best friend because she snapped in a moment of rage. The defense attorney even went on to allege that Michelle was a lying schemer and robbed Giselle of her family. It was unsettling, to say the least, for Michelle's family to hear her being blamed for her own murder. She did nothing to deserve what happened to her. And many of her family members had to leave the courtroom, especially during the texts that were being read out loud, the vile things that were being said about the person they loved. The trial lasted three weeks, and after four days of this jury deliberating, the prosecutor and Michelle's family, they were getting nervous. They were beginning to wonder, did the jury feel sympathy for Giselle because she's a pregnant mom. Even Mark Class, he was stunned that the jury was taking so long to return a verdict because in a lot of people's minds, the evidence pointed straight to Giselle. By the fifth day, the jury of six men and six women finally reached a verdict. Michelle's loved ones were holding hands in the front row as the jury entered that courtroom. The verdict? Giselle Esteban was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. She is eligible for parole in 2029, which is coming up before we know it. The judge said that he had never seen a case with more compelling circumstantial evidence pointing straight to the killer. Another thing I thought was interesting was that Giselle's defense attorney said that Giselle finally told her, let it go, Andrea, pretty much acknowledging like she did it, like give it up, it's not worth fighting for. Wow. What an incredible story. I can honestly say I would have never pictured a friend or someone Michelle called a friend would turn on her in such a crazy way to actually murder her. Beware of frenemies. You never know who you're going to cross paths with in life. These girls met in high school. It frightens me. No wonder so many people have trust issues. And I am so sorry to Michelle and her family and her loved ones. They did such an amazing job keeping Michelle's spirit alive. And I hope that I've provided more help to keep her memory living on for as long as it can, forever. I want to thank you all so very much for being here and giving Michelle your time. I will see you in my next video. Bye.